So, so I know you, that's hot. Yeah, you're a bit God. of a you're a bit of a podcast veteran, now, mate. So you want to be about a fist away from yeah. the mic, maybe two, just so that we all got some. Yeah, so mate, I've been been follow, I've been checking your work out a lot. Yeah, I've been seeing you with uh, who is it, Paul Merson? Paul Merson, Ollie Ollerton. That's the one. Yeah, so Gary like, Neville as well before shit. that. Yeah, Gary Neville. Yeah, I did um, I hosted a two-hour men's mental health um, forum in a studio in Manchester with Gary Neville, and uh, it's, uh, it was pretty pretty difficult because I was supposed to be on the panel and then the host got COVID, so they upgraded me. To, Would you mind hosting it? I was like, well, okay, put me on the spot. Um, two hours. It was Michael Jubri as well, the ex-Chelsea player. Yeah, I remember Jubes. And uh, yeah, it's amazing. What an experience. You know, the, the the audience, I think it was about 100 people in the studio. And then they lost the footage. They no, lost the footage. They no, lost mate, the, no. the little SIM card or whatever it is we were footage on. So all they had was audio. So we're going to redo that um, at some point in the next couple of months. Shit. Dude, how are you getting yourself into these positions of, uh, yeah, like hosting events where Gary Neville and Ollie Ollison are there? Because they're, they're big names, man. I, I like yeah. Ollie Ollison especially. I, Got a lot of time and respect for him. I, I met him a while ago. But yeah, how are you getting yourself into these awesome positions? Um, you know what? It kind of just finds me organically. Um, they've just kind of reached out. So I've taught mental health support for five years now. And the companies I work with, some of the big companies, they get approached by um, big uh, platforms, social media teams. And so look, we, we want to put this on. So with the Oli Oliton and Paul Merson thing, it's part of, you know, on the tools, mm. that social platform with 5 yeah. million following. Yeah. It was for that in partnership with Toolstation. And they said, look, we, we think you'd be good to, to host this and be involved in it. And it just came my way. D Jeff Brazier, you know, a, a Jay Goody's ex. Yes. Working with him in the next couple yeah. of months as well. It's supposed to be really cool, on. actually. He's a nice guy. Yeah. You never know if what you see online is the authentic version of that person, but he is, I'm told, um, and when we've kind of chatted, just a real nice down-to-earth guy. Dude, I find it so hard to be like genuinely authentic online. I'm like, well, what is authentic online? Because you can't show, or can you show all your worst shit? You've got to balance it, haven't you? You can't be yeah. bombing people out too much No. by putting all, all your deepest, darkest fears and daily struggles on there I guess so you kind of think right well how do I inspire do I do that through just sharing my journey or do I try and put an upbeat spin to it I think no matter how hard you try you always try and put something that you feel is going to be half represented well or received well rather yeah it's hard, it's hard, well. yeah it's hard to post authentically I think on social media knowing that people are going to see and like or yeah. dislike it yeah, I think completely, there's that balance to everything, isn't there? You could be completely authentic, but actually, do people want to see that, want to hear that? It's going to land right. But then you can be this polished version that's unrealistic, that I think where social media has been, and people see that and go, oh, God, they got a perfect life. You know, I'm not married to the supermodel or the Ferrari or any of that stuff that's being presented. So I think there's that nice balance in the middle where we can be our true selves, but putting stuff out there that is going to inspire. It is us. But we want it to land in the right way for the right reason, and you know you do that. And I'm not just saying this gets your your podcast or blowing smoke up your ass. I was following you for about five years before we did that live. You know, just watching the stuff you were doing, the post. And I thought, yeah, that, I like that. It, it, I mm. get you know, get this guy. I think he, My he posts did, have just changed. Get, quite they've a lot, changed mate. a lot, yeah. but you know, on that journey of following you, you know, it's always had that same inspirational, driven, positive. These are the things you can do to live happy healthy and well and, and I, I like that i like Thank i want to i want to digest that stuff you know yeah. from someone real and honest but the stuff that i'm going to see and go yeah that's i'm going to try that i'm going to take that on board i try and mix it up with some struggles so i look back to like five years ago and when i read a post i'm, I'm gonna do a few i'm sure loads of people do this i cringe yeah because i'm like alex you didn't know shit and you're saying just what people want to hear and you know but i think the first part of that ryan is just like you know, if you want to be authentic, if you want to be yourself, you've got to know who that is first. Yeah. Like, you've got to know. Yeah. So you've got to get in tune with yourself and say, you know, I'm, I'm what is what I'm saying right now actually what I believe? Is it me? Regardless of, like, whether the world says, fuck you, I don't agree. Like, have you got the courage to say what you actually feel? Because that's hard today. It is. Yeah, because you can get publicly executed for saying the wrong thing. I've had it. I'm I've sure, had it. man. You know, What's the worst you've had? Um... The worst I've probably had, you know, people will say, they'll look at a post 
you know, it might be in a car or in London or so. Oh, it's all right for you to talk about mental health. You've got a great life, you know, promoting mental health in this way. And, you know, you've got a great this and a great that. Making assumptions, you know, without actually knowing the journey I've yeah. been on to get to that place. And even if it's opposed to me teaching in, you know, I taught at the top of the Shard in London, you know, I've been dragging cables and projectors around a dusty, um, community center back in the day. I've kind of got to that point through graft and hard work and doing all the things that I need to do to get to that point. And even when you're teaching some beautiful location, it's still challenges and stress, a different set of challenges. Um, but yeah, people think it's this this shiny, amazing life of mental health. But living with a mental illness, some days I'm going to get up and my head's going to tell me, you ain't shit, you're going to mess this up, it's going to go wrong, and I have to battle against that. So just people wrongfully judging and making assumptions about what's going on for you by a picture or a post. I know, More mate. Of course. I think that's one of the biggest issues with social media, isn't it? It's like the journey is invisible, so people see the current picture or yeah. or the assumption from that current picture. Because like I say, I've, I've, I've followed your stuff for a while, so I know it's been an absolute roller coaster for you, man. Like so many ups, so many downs, so many in-betweens. So like I would kind of never begrudge you if, if seeing you do well. What I love about you is like you look, I mean, look, you're covered in fucking tats, right? All across your neck and that. And I love it. But I think guys will relate more to that than some guy in a in a suit. No, not like even a Gary Neville. Like I, I love Gary Neville, but I'm totally honest with you, I'm going to listen to you more than Gary Neville about mental health. I just damn. And that's, yeah. that. that's, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's it's all personal, like you tap into the people that you see yourself in, don't yeah. you? So some yeah. of the stuff you've shared online is so vulnerable, mate, so raw. And I'm like, oh, I like that. I like that rawness. Because you look fucking hard as well. <laughs> and, and you can have a fucking fight. You've stepped in the cage, right? Yeah, twice. Yeah. Two pro cage fights. Boxed twice. Boxed last about three months ago. I know. Got my jaw fractured, oh, no, really? got my ass fucking handed to me <laughs> by an amazing fighter and got concussion for the trawl, but raised like three and a half grand for two yeah. and a half charities. Yeah. So, you know, it, you know what? I, I went and um, I thought about what do I want from this fight other than raising money? And I wanted to be divorced of ego because in the past, in my 20s, I'm like, yeah, I want people to think I'm a fucking fighter, I'm a hard guy, and I got a reputation, and I don't want none of that no more do you know what I mean it didn't mean didn't mean shit because I was struggling I was suffering on the inside so I asked to be divorced of ego and I got exactly that I got I got beat I got humbled in front of loads of people I knew you know I had to say I can't come out for the second round I had to make that decision and then back in my 20s I would have never done that I would have died in that cage or that ring but um, I got exactly what I asked for you know I got humbled mm. I got beat by a better fighter I got beat bad <laughs> and um, that was a positive how did you feel after? You know what? I felt all right. Did you? I felt okay. Obviously, fractured jaw and a concussion took a while to get get past. But um, there weren't no voices torturing you, saying like you should have gone out, like a little bit. Yeah, I of don't course. think you ever lose that. Of course, no. a little. Not compared to back in the day, I'd have absolutely hated on myself for that. I'd yeah. give myself a hard time. I'd want to get back in there straight away mm. and prove this man that I am. This you know stereotypical version of what I created in the twenties. Um, so there's always going to be an element of that to reflect on and watch but you know thoughts aren't facts and I kind of thought wow it's all right I'm 41 I can't be getting beat by 20 year olds are too fast they hit too hard these days I had my brain fried reading I don't know if you've do you read many likes yes right yeah. have you read The Untethered Soul fuck off do you like I that one you, so I, I teach every day pretty much and someone said to me about a month ago you'll really like this book, okay. Untethered Soul. <laughs> so I took it on holiday with me recently, just got yeah. back from a, a wedding abroad. I fucking love that book because it's like an Eckhart Tolle power of now, but in the practical sense of application because not everyone can sit like the Buddha, you know, removed from the stresses of life. It'd be easy to be present then, got no mm. stress. Mm. But I love that book. It's good, isn't it? Wicked book. I read it years ago, but I've just, I'm reading it now. I'm about halfway through. It's a different book, man. It's a different book now compared to when I first read it. I didn't really understand it when I first yeah. read it. And that's a good sign, you know, when you're developing and you read something twice and you're like, books are always different depending on the time that you read them. But in there it talks about like this who am I concept. I don't know if you remember this, but it kind of points around. So if we look around this this podcast studio, there's cameras, there's a door, there's a table, there's a cup. Like we're none of those things, right? Yeah. Like we're no, So we know we're nothing external. <laughs> and then like you've just said, thoughts aren't facts. So we know thoughts are going to come, they're going to go, like they're not us. So it's like, well, hold on. If I'm nothing in the external world, 
and I'm not any thoughts or, or feelings. Like, what the, what am I? Like, what yeah. exists yeah. past that? And this book explained it well. It, it says all we can be is the awareness then. So all we can do is see the thoughts that come in our head yeah. and know that we're feeling something. So we observe and we can detach. Yeah. This is this is what I've struggled. This is what has caused me to have such bad mental health in my past. It's like, I didn't know that you could act differently if you were angry. Mm. I thought if you were angry, it meant you had to react because that was so real and yeah. you didn't have a choice to detach. So you shout, you swear, you're irritable, you get your own way or some men fight, right? Yeah. And I thought, fucking hell, just reading that, just that confirmation of, hold on, Alex, you don't, ha just because you're feeling upset doesn't mean you are upset. You can yeah, step back yeah. and just, it's just a feeling that you're experiencing. Be the watcher, be the yeah. observer of the that. observer, it's called, yeah. Yeah, and, and when you think about those reactions as well, they don't really serve much purpose to us other than distress. So like, let's say I'm angry at you. I'm angry at you, I'm hanging you, I'm thinking those thoughts, it's raising that emotion. That's like me drinking poison and expecting you to get poorly off it. Mm. You ain't. You're probably not even aware unless I'm externally behaving and reacting to you. So, so yeah, you can um, create and cause a lot of distress in the mind. One thousand percent. Well, I, th I think most of us do that, and it's really interesting because it points out as well. Like, if you've got fear about, I don't know, jealousy or something, you will carve your life out so that you don't experience those feet, or, or you yes. do your best to prepare the world so that you don't have to feel jealousy. Yeah. So you'll try and control and modify things. Yeah. Because if, if you feel that jealousy, you can't handle it. So then you create that life, which means, well, you know, I've got, I've got to control my missus because I feel jealous, I don't know what to do with it. So yeah. don't wear this, don't wear that, don't go here, don't speak to him. And I get that, I can see that now. I can see yeah, how you can carve yeah. a life that you actually don't want yeah. through, the, through protection so that you don't feel those feelings. Definitely. Fucking insane, it's right? easier to safeguard it than feel those feelings and that emotion. Let me safeguard my life. Let yeah. me go out with this type of person or mm -hmm. that type of person. And when it don't work, oh, it must have been them. It must have been this. I'm going to change that. And then you're just chasing, 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 trying to protect, like you said, these feelings that you want to shy mm -hmm. away from. And it's like, hang on. I could look at this in a different way, perhaps. How, how how's your mental health shaped your relationships? Like, and let, let's spin it. On its on its ugly head first, like how has it played a negative role in the relationships you've had with with women in your life? Oh, massively! It's it's basically um, absolutely owned uh, any decision to have a relationship I ever had in my early days because my OCD is pure O. It's that intrusive thought cycle, and what it attaches to for people often is the thing they care about the most. So it'll attack that thing that means the most to you. So for example, I'm in a great relationship now, probably the most, definitely the most open and authentic relationship because me and my Mrs. Jamie, we went through recovery together, like an AACA program. Okay. So yeah. where you really work through and face and feel emotion. But within that, there was a lot of honesty. And, you know, you, you hear stuff about your partner's past and you share stuff about your past that you maybe don't want to stereotypically share or wouldn't have shared before. Um, so being exposed to that, my OCD clung onto it. It's almost like that uh, Nirvana song, um, aneurysm. You know, I love you that much you make me sick. And that's what it's like. I love that much. It was like, right, I know what we're going to destroy. I'm going to destroy your fucking happiness. Yeah. But previous to that... I would choose relationships that were safe. I'd choose relationships where I know I can't get emotionally attached to you. I won't allow myself. And I mean, I've, I've gone out with a lot of strippers before because I knew, well, I'm never going to get close to you. I can't. My OCD won't allow it. So mm. I could go out with someone that did a particular thing or behave in a particular way, keeping that arm's length, keeping that distance, you know, keeping them, keeping them apart. Sorry, mate. Is That's that right. Yeah, phone? just flick it. I'm silent. No worries. So yeah, it, it made these decisions for me without me consciously realizing I'm gonna go out with this type of person, that type of person and create all these safe, this safety net around my mental health. How was that hearing the, the past of the person that you love? Because as soon as you said that, I could feel it in my belly. I'm really? Like, that had yeah. an effect on you? Yeah, big time. I'm like, that's probably one of my biggest fears right there, sitting really? down. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Because yeah. like you say, it once, if you can let a thought go, it's fine. But yeah. if, if, if a thought comes in my head and it bothers me, I'll keep hold of it. Yeah. And I'll keep hold of it and I'll keep hold of it. And like a year later, no joke, it could yeah. have manifested into something so big and so scary that it's took over my entire fucking life. 
totally just by not being able to let go of it. So yeah, yeah. how did you ha- how did you handle that? Because it must have been an uncomfortable situation for both of you, right? Like, it was. yeah, yeah. There's lots going on at that time. So being sober for the first time, you know, in 25 plus years, um, was was different. Was interesting. And then I thought I was going to be okay. I thought, oh wow, I'm, I'm I'm cured. I'm fine. I can hear about all this and I can let it go. And I kept trying to convince myself that I can let this go. I can let this go until a point where I went, oh fuck, what have I done here? I've heard about all this stuff and I can't unhear it. And it's not like there was anything, you know, out there or you know, like oh my god, that's terrible. Just you know, stuff you wouldn't necessarily share hmm. with a partner. Yeah, with, sure. with your With your suitor. Um, and it all kind of to mount up and just grew and grew and grew. And that was the point and the reason I got sectioned right. because it just crept in through the back door 1% at a time. And, and then, because I was pretending to be all right, you might hear something else. Yeah. So I'm still dealing with these things I've heard. Oh, shit. Now I've heard something else. Now I've heard something else. And it just mounted up on top. Do you find it's not always what you hear, though? It's what you make it, right? So I yeah. could hear something that could be quite innocent or like we've all got a past like of course we have yeah there's no judgment yeah right so it's not the thing that said it's the thing that i make it definitely so yeah it's a fleeting comment or it's a part of somebody's history but in my head it's oh, it's fucking ugly yeah. make makes you not a nice person yeah i made it to be you. something terrible yeah. I've, I've fictitiously added these details yeah. and when I find out the truth of some of this, because you don't want to ask, because what if I ask you, oh, look, I'm thinking this about this, and they say, yeah, that's right. You go, fuck, I've got nowhere to go then. At least yeah. I can think what it might not be. But when I did get to the point of crisis, I said, look, this is where I'm at. This is where my head's at. Oh, that's not the case. Oh, shit. I made that to be what it was. But you sure? Like, I thought, this, nah, no, nah, that's not, you're thinking about it totally wrong. So uh, that's the grip that OCD will have on me you don't want to ask because what if it is true but if you did ask it probably isn't you're stuck you're in purgatory you're in the middle i might as well stay in this middle ground where i can try and convince myself that ain't the case then actually know the truth and have it confirmed that is the case so you just you've got nowhere to go no breathing space no wiggle room makes total sense man i remember meeting this girl in my late 20s and she was fucking wild man like she was wild she was like a beautiful person good looking girl she had big booze, mate, tattoos. <laughs> she was doing really well for herself in business. Everyone yeah. loved her. And the reason everyone loved her was because she was a real energetic, bubbly person. So I was attracted to her too. And I was like, you know, I wanted to be around her because, you know, her energy was infectious. So, you know, we hit her off and we, we got together. And then all of a sudden, like, the, th- the things that I loved about her, like the fact that she was really popular, started to, like, tap into my insecurities. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, the way she dressed. I was like, yeah, that used to be sexy. I found that attractive, but if I find it attractive, hmm, other men yeah. will too. So tell you what, how about you don't dress like that anymore? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? How about you don't be as popular anymore? And like, all of this was like subconsciously, like, you know, I didn't want to be doing that kind of shit because it's fucking horrible. It's it's horrible for both of you because you're trying to control something that, that you shouldn't be trying to control, which yeah. is basically the, s- the source of a lot of pain. And then you make their life fucking miserable because you start to crush who they are and what you actually fall in love with. So this whole relationship thing, like it always brings out the ghosts and the fucking demons inside of me. It it's does. the best way to look at it. Which kind yeah. of shows me what that's what I need to look like go into. Yeah, now, shows yeah. you where the growth is, right? Sure. Now, yeah. now you've got that awareness. Yeah. Um, to to know that this stuff exists. Cause some people haven't heard of the tethered soul, or won't, they'll hear us say about you know you could be the watcher, not the yeah. thinker, and you know be the the kind of conscience in the background, the awareness. They'll be like, what the fuck? Mm. But if I'd known about that in my twenties, then I'd have been a bit more open to it. Wouldn't have been ready for it then. But people aren't aware that this stuff is out there. Well, that's it, mate. You've just said it. You've just nailed it. Like, if you were in your 20s, wouldn't it have been nice for someone like you to help you at 20? Yeah. So I, I'm doing an event for 16 to 21 year olds. And I just thought, well, what would I, what did I need at that age? You know, I needed a bit of guidance, a bit of strength, a bit of courage. I didn't need to hide from all the stuff that I was scared of, that I needed to look at it. And this is the danger of hiding shit, isn't it? Like you're yeah. saying, burying it, because it will fucking come back. It will kill you. It, it can kill you. Guys kill themselves all the time. That's it. Over heartaches, over depression. And like, I get it. You know when people say it's selfish? I, I don't think so. I think, I understand. I understand why people take their own lives. It's not, I'm not saying it's right. I'm not, I'm not saying there's, mm. 
you know, of course there's better ways, but I, get, I don't know about you, but I get it. I can feel the pain so much that I understand why people do it. I to- totally get it. You, you, you can't see a way out, a way through, and you just want the pain to end. Mm-hmm. And that is sadly what people find as, and I use this word loosely, the solution. That will, if I do that, then that's a way out the pain, a way for it to end. So I, I do totally get it from being that way, you know, March 24th last year. And I work in mental health. So you think, oh, you should have all the answers then. But in that moment, my head said, don't tell anyone you're struggling. They'll think you can't do your job. And also I thought, well, if I can't help me and I work in this, no one can help me. I lost hope. But that would have been um, a permanent solution to a temporary problem and the pain would have ended because mm. you know, I'd have ended my life. But I do get it. Do you think there's things waiting for us after we die? Because I had this very uncomfortable conversation with Matty who believes it strongly that you know there, there's more after and that the potential to be punished for, and as, I'm sorry, I'm butchering him a little, his quote a little bit. I don't mean that in a sense, but like there is consequences to pay for taking your own life. Like you, you if it does continue, you will be tortured in the next life too. So it makes sense that you try and make your life better whilst you can. I don't know what you think yeah, to any of that. It's oh, real man. metaphysical, deep stuff that I, I, sometimes I don't even look at because it's terrifying. It, it's so deep, isn't it? You can so get lost deep. down a rabbit hole. You know, yeah, are we course, humans yeah. having a spiritual experience? Are we are we uh, spiritual beings have a human experience? What's waiting in the afterlife? Loads of different faiths, beliefs. Um, and loads of ways where people feel like they're getting closer to that, right? With things like DMT and psilocybin mm. and ayahuasca. And they say they go through that spiritual experience or enhancer and then they can see truly how they're supposed to live in this life and what's beyond it um the jury's out for me on on that one i think you get so involved and and lost in it i do believe there's something more going on that we're absolutely not aware of what that looks like and what that is I'm not too. I'm not too sure, but I do believe that you know energy's got to go somewhere, right? And we're all like balls of energy, and after we pass on, it can't just be it. Surely, I used to think that. Just so it, it's quite not a great thought. To think we die and that's it. That is it. So it's nice to think there's something, but I do kind of believe that now. But what that is, I don't know. Yeah. See, I don't know whether it's nice to think that there is or not. It depends how you're feeling. So if you're tortured in this life, I'm not sure you'd want another one. No. I, I, like I think the whole point of escaping it is so that you don't feel it at all anymore. The thing that, that makes me wonder whether there's more is because, like in the untethered soul, if we're not the external and we're not our thoughts, we're just awareness, Like, does that mean just because the physical body dies that that awareness goes with it? Like If we're not just our skin and our bones and we're more, because like that voice in your head, it's nothing really to do with your skin and bones. No. It's, it's that really weird voice that you don't know where it comes from. Yeah. So it's like, well, does that hang around? Where does that go? Where, where, does, it where do? does it go? Does, does it die with us or does it? Does that linger? Does that hang around? Have you ever seen a film called Martyrs? No. Right, my friend said, because uh, he likes world cinema, way back in the day, this is when like, Blockbuster Video was out there, he said, you love this film called Martyrs. So I went and rent this film from like the, you know, the world section. It's subtitled, it's French. And before they let me rent it out, this is like maybe 10 years ago, maybe longer, I don't know when Blockbuster went pop, they made me read and sign a disclaimer before I rent this film. And it's kind of about this. So Martyrs is about this group, this organisation. They'll, they'll get someone, they'll take them into this centre and they'll make them suffer. Suffer, suffer, suffer to a point where they turn into a martyr and they're able to see the afterlife and then share it with the person that caused the suffering. And... It doesn't have an ending. I mean, this film ended right, and I thought, I've got to walk around somewhere like open and safe, like Asda. I need to be around people. It had that effect on me. But this person becomes a martyr. They share with this other person, you know, they whisper it, what the afterlife look like, looks like. And then this person kills himself. Now, does that mean Fucking they are in the shit in the afterlife? Or does it mean it's that good they couldn't wait to get there? I was just like, wow, it's blowing my mind. What a great question that is. Yeah. Yeah. Would you, if you could see what was ahead of you, would you? Would you choose to to see it, or would you rather just wait until you get there? It's almost like a question about if you knew what age and year you were going to die, would you know? I don't know. I think I'm quite comfortable where I'm at. I don't think knowing or not knowing, I don't know what effect it might have on me. I don't want to, you know. 
Yeah, I totally get it. I always question sometimes whether like even the work that I'm doing, is it helping or hindering my life? Like focusing on mental health, talking about it all the time. I'm, I, I, I have started to think like, what would my life look like if I just lived it? Mm. However, I did take that approach and it didn't work out very well. So that's what kind of like was boozy about me and all sorts of things. Do you know what I mean? When I didn't yeah. really pay attention to this. So I don't know what the answer is. I just probably know my life's better for giving it a load more attention. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's a practical human element to this. We we need a purpose. We need goals. We need something to focus on and work towards. And what we do day to day kind of gives us that. When you say you you thought this might hinder, you know, your, your mental health, what do you mean by that? How? So the only books I read are self-help, self-development. Yep. So like all my energy is put there. All the people I respect that they go all in on something and I'm all in on the mental health thing. I think when you're touched by it, like sometimes you realize it's power and you realize there's nothing more important in life than how you feel. And I know that. So like I say, I've, I've driven a couple of nice cars, I've got a nice home, I've had a good business. It doesn't really matter too much. Like it's nice. Hmm. But the pain of losing your marbles made all that stuff irrelevant. Yeah. So I kind of know what's important. Yeah. You prioritize. So yes. However, how you would get to that level of good mental health, I think the answer is in that book and tell it all. Mm. I really do. I've read hundreds of books, mate. But this one is like, Alex, you need to read me and read me and read me for the next 10 years over and over again. I'm doing the same. Yeah, because if you can detach from those thoughts and feelings, you can live a good life, man. You can live a life yeah. that's not that painful. Yeah. And you can accept things for how they be. So that woman that you really want to be with, like that will work or it won't. No more. Don't invest fucking everything in that business or that woman or that. Don't do that. It's too painful. It's like, fuck. It is a great book, isn't it? It's and you know what? Awesome. It's only quite a short book, right? It's not short that chapters. many yeah. pages. Yeah. Well, that's why I like it, mate. Yeah. 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 I, I, like. I like the power now, Eckhart Tolle, but that is quite a deep involved book and yeah. even tells you in the book when to put it down and look, reflect on what you've just read. And I had, it took me maybe four years to read that. You know, someone gave it me after a, a training session. I've taught their mental health. Same as The Untethered Soul. Read this book and I kind of just, you know, gathered dust. And I liked it, but it's hard to read. The Untethered Soul is, is how to practically, you can apply it like straight away. You mm. know, It's all right knowing that we want to be present and conscious and aware and not let our thoughts affect us negatively. But fuck me, how? Like when you've got kids and dogs and life and traffic and financial pressure, how do I adopt that? It's all right. The universal live mindset with the Untethered Soul, I think it really teaches you how to practically apply it. I wonder what makes you pick up a book like that. Like, so... I mean, you're 41, I'm 37. We're talking about this now. Like, Do you think there's anything that could have made you be more interested in this in your 20s? Or again, is it a part of evolution and life where look, you'll look at this when you're ready and only when you're ready? So I mean, you could take a young lad now who's struggling at 21 perhaps and say, look, dude, the answers are in this book. It doesn't fucking matter. Like, we, learn, we live our life and then we learn, not the other way around. What, what do you think? Like, how, how can we help the younger guys perhaps not suffer as much as what we needed to i think you're right like i might not have been ready to be presented with say that book or an initiative or a strategy in my younger days and often we want to give a solution right i want to take the pain away or make your life easier you should do this you should try that you should if i'm not ready i'm not doing any of it but if i'd have started this journey earlier if i'd have been signposted to it earlier or was aware of it earlier then my my i don't know what you want to call it self-development spiritual journey would have started earlier so i'd have probably be more into it and advanced and developed so i don't know if we can say right read this book it's going to help you but actually if you just showed me that book back in my 20s at least then it's on my radar you might have planted a mm, seed yeah. i might have read that book but i might have looked for similar books on self-help or mental health or spirituality or whatever so i think um it's that awareness to know that this space exists you know self-help is a space that exists there are things you can do read and absorb that will help you to feel better live a better life happy healthy well however you want to capture it so what's the essence of your workshops then how do you help people with their mental health i guess it's men and women right everyone yeah, yeah what, everyone. what 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 is the core kind of principle or philosophy behind 
what you do? There's the official course by Mental Health First Aid International. So there's okay. a course yep. like Physical First yep. Aid, which is a legal requirement. There's a an equal counterpart for mental health, Mental Health First Aid. So I teach their official courses. But what I've done more of during lockdown is companies will approach and say, we've got people working from home, isolated. That's what they're struggling with. Or hybrid working or social anxiety. People have been locked up for two years. Now they're afraid to come back into the office. So I'm being asked for more bespoke courses. And what I do is teach people how to support others. So I don't support, well, I do support people, but I believe in teaching other people how to react and respond and where to signpost to. Because there's only so many hours in a day. You know, mm. if I'm supporting an individual, you might be there for an hour, two hours, letting them share their head, get their emotion out. But if I can teach 16 people at a time who are then going to go on to have kind conversations, signpost people, because you're not expected to have the answer or solution, who can? But just have a, a kind listening ear and then say, where have you looked? What's help? Have you tried here? Have you tried there? And increase that toolkit of where we're signposting people to. Because let's face it, can I go and see my doctor and get counselling or therapy tomorrow or next week even? No chance. Six months waiting list, 12 months waiting list. But there is a lot of strategies out there, mostly through not-for-profits, charities, organisations that we can signpost people to to get help and support. So that's mm. the essence of what I do. And yes, men and women, it, you know what, it's everyone, Alex. It's construction. I've been teaching internationally today, an engineering company. I've taught at the top of the shard. I've taught vets. I've taught, taught um, clinical directors. And when I did that, I thought, well, I'm going to teach clinical directors, you know, those clinically, medically qualified. They all took something away from it. So it is, if you've got thoughts, feelings, emotions, and behaviors, and all the stuff in between, then it, it's relevant. No, that's brilliant, mate. I like the idea of the toolkit. I guess then the the ne next part to that is like teaching people how to to not use it, but yeah, consistently have it as part of their life, right? Yeah, because that's because if you think about what lockdown was, because apparently more people died of suicide than they did of coronavirus. If I've got that allegedly, right, allegedly, yeah, allegedly, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what. There's not official stats, but you're right. That's everyone's saying that is absolutely accurate. Well, I think it was easy. Like I think. Again, I don't. I'm not an expert in this because I don't watch the news and stuff. But if I don't know, let's just say you had an illness, but you were infected with coronavirus, it would go down as a coronavirus death. But I think suicide is slightly different. Like they have to be so certain that you took your own life that a lot of suicides don't even, you know, get, get yeah. put on the fucking tally chart, which is worrying. So it, it could is. be. It's definitely not any lower than we think. So it could only be. Higher, underreported. Even yeah. when there's been a death by hanging and a note left, the coroner hasn't always recorded it as suicide. There's things like death by misadventure. So you're right, it's got to be like absolutely solid that this is the case. So it is underreported, which is scary. Well, that shocks me. I, I knew a lad that hung himself. Um, and yeah, they were, were very hesitant to put it down because he. Uh, th this was their words. He could have tripped. Serious? Could right. Yeah, it could have. Because they have to take every... Like you say, it could be, uh, uh, what, did, what was the word you used? Misadventure? Yeah, death by misadventure and all these other different yeah. things they can record it so, as. Crazy, but what lockdown did show us is like, if you don't go outside, if you don't socialise, if you don't take care of yourself, you will your mental health will suffer. So if you think about that, if we flip that on its head, it kind of tells us what we need to do, doesn't it? Yeah. Which is exactly the opposite of what the government was asking us to do. It's like, don't lock yourselves in your four walls. Mm. Go and get your vit D, go and exercise, go and be sociable. And it's, yeah, the world we live in today doesn't quite support that, I don't think. It, it makes it easier to not do those things. Yeah, it doesn't. People undervalue that stuff. They don't realise that stuff has got such power. I think mm. it's about getting good at taking tablets and... If I took my medication, because I'm medication free, I've withdrew with professional help in the right way. I just wanted to declare that. I didn't just stop taking it. Don't anyone ever do that. I've engaged the clinical team and said, I want to withdraw. How are we doing it? But if when I was on meds, I took the meds and did none of the stuff you've just mentioned. Let's say I didn't get vitamin D from natural daylight. I spent too long on a screen. I didn't exercise. I didn't meditate or practice mindfulness. If I didn't do any of that, and just took my medication, it would have done fuck all. I'd have been really poorly. I took my medication and did all that. Now I'm in a space where I'm not on medication, but I still need to do all that, that toolkit of stuff, and avoid the things I need to avoid, and it means I'm, I'm well. You know, I could have OCD, and you wouldn't know unless I shared it. I've always got to keep a watch on it, I'll never be cured, 
but I'll be in recovery where it doesn't have to have a nasty grip on my life. So those things you're talking about, get outdoors, socialize, talk, exercise, they've got a lot of power. <laughs> they've got, got a lot of value. It's so right. It's so, And I know that, but I sometimes underplay the importance of that. Because I think you get a little bit concerned that you keep saying the same shit on social media. So I could talk about that every day, but that's because it's the fucking truth. It is the truth. Do you know what I mean? We do want to do all the things people are hesitant to do, like go for a walk. Yeah. Like, go, like if you're listening to this now, like, like ask yourself how much time you've had out in fresh air, right? It's like all the thing, all the basic stuff. Like, what what do you think takes us away from that? Then, like, what are we so busy doing if we're not doing the things that are good for us? I think it's the pace of life. I think it's the pace of life and there's always something to engage yourself with and be involved with. You know, I'm not demonizing phones, but that little hit of dopamine when you get a ping or a knock. I am, mate. I think they're terrible, man. Yeah. And blue light. This. Yeah, I know this. I'm switched on, but I'm finding it so hard to detach from my phone right now. Yeah. And I'm switched on. I'm disciplined. I'll go to the gym. I'll do all the right, I'll eat the right foods. I'm still struggling. I was speaking to um, Becky, who was a therapist the other day. I said, imagine being 13 or 14. Like, you know, with all the resilience we've got, it's still hard for us, right? We mm. still have to constantly win, win our will each day. Like, don't spend too much screen time. Yeah. Go outside, do the right things. If you're 13 or 14, imagine having that battle now. Yeah. It's hard. That's it. No one teaches you how to use phones, the digital space and social media. Yeah. And for our generation, I imagine you remember not having a phone, right? I do. I think they call it iGen, don't they? If you were born in 1995 or after, that's where the worst mental health lies. Right. So that's what, 28? If you were yeah. 28 years old now or younger, right? you've been born with a phone in your hand. Got ya. So it's, and it's in relation to the worst suicide rates we've ever had. Wow. Yeah. Mate, I was oh, at the wow. gym the other day and I looked around and I, for a moment I was scared because I'm not exaggerating. Every single person at the same time had their head in their phone at the gym. Taking a photo probably, checking in, proving it or just scanning and scrolling. They weren't even doing that, mate. That would, that, do you know what? That wouldn't seem too weird. It was like zombie nation. It was like they were detached from reality. Mm. Honestly, it was scary. Slumped shoulders head in the screen, just looking like fucking they were spaced out. Like the souls left the body and losing the will to live, Serious. just mindlessly scrolling. Serious. And I'm no better. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen to me, but I treat the gym like an, a, ch a chance to escape that stuff, not yeah. to go into it more. Definitely. And there's a, there's a great, I can't remember where the cinema's based, but they have a strict no phone policy because they want people to be absorbed in the film, not in their phone. If I ever set up a gym again, I'd do the same thing. Yeah, I'd have 100%. a phone-free gym. I don't know if any exist, but something I really want to do, I might pick your brains on it if, if that's all right, is run an event called Unplugged. I was about to do it before lockdown came in. And it's just a weekend where like digital media is banned. Like, no emails, no phones, just a bunch it. of guys hanging out, talking. Yeah, 100%. Any support cool, you need with that, I'm, I'm in. Because, um, you know, it's hard. We're not... I'm not being judgmental. I get drawn into that space. I've got to have my social media, my emails for work, yep. you know, but creating those boundaries, recognizing when I'm having too much screen time and I need to be present and just leaving it, I have to leave it out of harm's way. If it's within distance sure, and I man. see a bit, oh, it might be that email, or oh, I've thought of something for the to-do list, I'll have to fuck the phone off and leave it in the car go for a walk or leave it at home and go to the gym. I don't want that temptation even there and that's the way I do it. I just leave it. Yeah, out of the way, and I can't get to it. Yeah, I'm very similar, mate. I have to have those hard rules. I can't flirt with this stuff, mm -hmm. and I knew it was a problem last week, and it's where all my attention needs to go because I wanted to watch a film, but I was getting a bit ang anxious because I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to separate myself from my phone because mm. it's got, it's got my friends on there who I message, you know, it's got my emails, social. I thought, fucking Alex, this is pretty bad when you're getting a little bit twitchy because you haven't got a phone to pick up yeah. and reach for. I thought this is an issue. Like, let's get this shit sorted. Yeah. So again, whenever that happens to me, I pick up. Like sometimes I don't know if this happens to you. Books call me a little bit and say you need to read me. Like the Untethered Soul. Alex, read me. Fucking read me. Because I've had that for years, and don't know why it's just jumped back into my hands. And I'm reading Digital Minimalism at the minute. Okay. That's a good. One. A guy called Cal Newport. Right. Yeah. And what he does well is like instead of us saying, "Look, young lad, this is not good for your mental health." He goes so far into detail about the data, about you know stories, um, loads of subjects about the actual damage it does, what it does to the brain, 
all sorts of good reasons why you would want to put your phone down rather right. than us just saying because you should. Talk about blue light as well. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. He's more on the psychological aspect, like the how it affects um, real communication with people. So it's saying basically that the more time you interact online means you'll spend less time interacting in real life. Simple, right? But it's true, yeah, isn't it? It's true. Like, so although Makes social sense. media connects us, it actually disconnects a lot of people because yeah. even the effort to ring someone now, I mean, how many times do people ring each other now to see how they're doing? It's usually a WhatsApp text. I'm trying to get better at this, mate. People, When I ring people though and they answer the phone, it's almost like, what do you want? What's wrong? Yeah, what's wrong? What, what's happened? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, like, why are you... Like, oh, fucking hell, I'm so shocked sure you've called. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. It is, isn't it? You know, people are voice noting a bit more now because it's oh, nice yeah, to hear I'll, your voice, yeah, but I'll it's still a call. Bit, yeah. An old-fashioned... All right, mate, just ring and say how you're doing. How you mm. feeling? What's going on? How's your week been? Oh, uh, I ain't really got time to talk right now or why you're calling all that shocked, surprised response. Yeah, man. Or looking at your phone thinking it's just an inconvenience that someone's calling you. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. you've got shit to do. Yeah, I ain't got time for this right now. I'll ring them back yeah. later. Later yeah. never happens. Yeah. It's fucking insane. Yeah. So ha what's what's like in the future pipeline for you now? Like, do you think much about future? Or, or do you just try and get up each day and live a good, 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 happy day in life? Just 24 hours a time. Is that how you a do it? Bit of planning. But I just want to do what I do really well. You know, every conversation counts. Every person I meet counts. Every training course counts. I don't know who might be in front of me on that training course that will go on to save a life as my life was saved by someone I qualified. I don't know if you know that. No. But yeah, so someone I taught mental health first aid um, used it on me to save my life. Wow. Good job I fucking trained them, right? <laughs> They'd be using it on me. And, so um, well, let's hear about that. What, what, what happened there? So I taught um, my partner, Jamie, we've got a hair salon together that in the evening is a well-being salon. We'll do like Wim Hof breathing, we'll oh, do cool. you know, cold exposure, meditation classes, yoga, all that stuff. And I taught her in a salon because what she said in their industry is that you might have a client for 10 years. You know, you're doing their hair for 10 years and they're sharing their life. They've had a relationship breakdown, the kids this, you know, this has happened, that's happened. Be useful for us to have some mental health first aid so we're great listeners and we know how to respond and react. So I taught them and then um, she could tell I was getting really unwell. You know, them subtle changes, the bags under the eyes, the behaving differently. You know, just them little tells. And she, one day, because I kept saying, I'm all right, I'm fine, leave me alone, what are you about? Fucking, don't bother me, I'm fine. One day she asked clearly and directly, are you feeling suicidal? Because we know with asking directly and clearly, that's the right thing to do. You'll never plant a seed in anyone's head. All the professionals agree. By asking someone clearly and directly, what you might be doing is giving them a safe space to share what they're going through, unravel what what's uh, what they're going through. And she didn't, you know what, when she asked that question clearly and directly, looked in my eyes, asked me, are you, are you feeling suicidal? I just, the, the mask came off, the guard came down, tears, the lot. And it was that kind of turning point. She made me get a crisis plan in place. And that is simply a document in your phone. If you feel this way, don't think, just act, call this number. And on that, it had a friend's number who's a crisis nurse. So really fortunate to have this network of people in the world. And I did, and on the morning when I was going to go to Wix, buy a rope, knew the tree, knew the place, I kept getting this document up. I was like, oh, fuck it, I'm going to rip. Nah, maybe I will. And I just made the call. I just rang the number. And that's when I got talked to hospital by ambulance um, and was sectioned. So it does work. I've felt this firsthand that this training does actually work it's effective and that's why it doesn't matter from teaching at the top of the shard fancy place in london or anywhere it don't matter because it's who's on that course and they're all volunteers so you know what if i put myself forward for a mental health first aid or support course it's probably for a reason so who am i going to meet what have they done or what journey have they been on who are they supporting that's what means a lot to me so the future i don't really think about too much it's day in day out and i get to teach every single day which i'm grateful for so upon reflection, do you, can you do you know why you wanted to kill yourself? It was those things we started talking about. So going through that journey of um, AA and CA, of like recovery from addiction, I was six months sober when I was suicidal. And I'd been using drugs and alcohol as a coping strategy for 25 plus years. Right. So by removing that suddenly, without recognizing the effect it might have, because substance withdrawal, 
is a risk like substance use and you know that that sharing information my ocd came back with a vengeance and i didn't consider that you know what you're removing the thing you're doing to get out of your head and have a bit of escape from reality you're going to be faced with feelings and emotion in a heavy way and my ocd just took hold took a grip and i kind of neglected it i'd kind of forgot about it really it, it could kind of manage it didn't really have too much of an effect but it came back were you a weekend drinker or were you drinking all the time weekend weekend never lost a job wasn't alcoholic or alcoholism but i'd go and have a few drinks the weekend decompress then back to business on a monday but i've been doing that for that long hmm. and maybe a few glasses of wine in the week you know yeah. nothing that anyone would look at and go fucking oh, hell you know you're drinking what they might seem too much but you think that was enough just to keep things under wraps that that weekend release that saturday night release was enough just to to push things down to the surface yeah and there's been times when don't get me wrong I mean, i've done three two seasons in ibiza i've been 23 times so there's the excessive times as well sure but yeah it, it, it was enough and that's the thing with addiction people will will judge that like they will mental health they'll say of course you feel shit because you're going out doing x y z but asking with compassion that compassionate inquiry that gabor Marte talks about why you know is it they're doing that because they're hiding away from escaping from an emotional struggle so rather than pointing the finger because we point the finger we've all got always got three fingers pointing back at us okay so why are you doing that let's talk about exploring it rather than you need to stop you shouldn't be doing you know that doesn't help anyone yeah i guess you've got to be ready to do that work and have a look at why you're drinking right Definitely. that's the first step yeah because you can't help someone that doesn't want to be helped i'm assuming can't force change with anything you know i might see you struggling and i think shit i want to help him you know i might reach out and you might reject my help i might be patient persistent kind creative keep reaching out if you're not ready or aware you're not ready and aware and that's fine that's absolutely fine so yeah you've got to be willing to do the work have that awareness, recognise it, and then know where to go next. So in your experience then, because I haven't got to the answer of this yet, how, how do you think, without people reaching like such a painful point, like what do you think is going to spur change? Do you think it's going to be purely like cultural and society? Because like, you know, you needed to get to your rock bottom, I needed yeah. to hit mine. Like if you speak to anyone who's similar to us, they will all will have hit that fucking horrible space where they're like, I either die or I do something different. So like, how do you think you avoid getting to that point? Awareness and education, and then talking. It sounds basic, but it, you've, got to, you've got to clear your head, you've got to share your head. And I think the thing that discourages people do that it is the stigma. You know, I don't want to be judged. I don't want people to feel I'm weak or all of this stuff. But also, I tried to reach out in the past. And because people didn't have the awareness and education, to react in the right way they reacted badly in a way that would make it worse or just not help so i'd reach out and say look i'm going through this oh you'll be all right mate don't fucking worry about it you know man up or get on with it or you should do this you should do that so that can discourage people from ever reaching out and talking again so i think we need to we do need to break down this stigma and judgment we need to get better at talking they say if you're struggling reach out what about reaching in it's a two-way street so i think education and awareness for everyone so everyone's got a a better, more sophisticated understanding of what mental health is. We seem to be in a better space, but some places I teach you think, fuck, it's like going back 20 years, really? Like, mm. it, it, everyone needs to not just throw around the fancy slogans like it's okay not to be okay and stuff like that, to really know that a mental health is neither good nor bad. Mental health, people assume is bad. Oh, what's wrong? It could be mental well-being. Could be mental illness at one end and mental well-being at the other end and everything in between and all these life experiences that would affect and shape that so this really good understanding of what mental health is i think then we can all start to have these conversations and get the help and support that someone might need i love that i've never heard that like reach out reach in yeah i've never heard that that saying i like that i think that's yeah, that's smart to, to to slow down and have a look at what's going on. I think we're we're pretty hypocritical of like we 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 say we encourage men to talk, but if you have a look at what happens publicly or or in society, like if you say the wrong thing in the, this day and age, you get like I say publicly crucified. So that's that's not reinforcing. A yeah. You know, on social media, you say the wrong thing, or it's not maybe like you can anyway. There's fear everywhere, is what I'm saying. Like it's 
it's a it's a scary time to step forward and be yourself yeah which i think then people were like well if i can't be myself how how do i fit into this world how how can i exist without you know being attacked so much i think that's where a lot of guys are struggling because the stigma itself i think is so much better than it used to more men are talking but suicide rates are still going up so i'm like mm, something doesn't make sense there and whether it is the lack of basic fundamentals such as fresh air exercise getting yourself in shape i don't know but something something's off because i feel like like if you think about how mental health was 10 years ago no one was really talking about it that much now there's calm there's mind there's so many great charities yeah so much support so many helplines but we're still heading in the wrong direction it's like what what why is it going wrong and where is it going wrong yeah, absolutely. And I think it, everything's thrown out a little bit by COVID. You know, we haven't really had any official data. So that kind of throws a spin in the mix. But yeah, it's still not in what we'd call a healthy place or, or improving. And people still de- seem to be struggling. I think it's individually finding out what is in your toolkit. What do you, what can you embrace that improves and protects your mental health and what do you need to avoid and people would dismiss the basics and some of those things might work and they might not but keep moving forward and trying stuff out be open to adapt and evolve as your mental health will it's like Wim Hof you know that's become popular I've been doing that 10 years but when I first spoke about that 10 years ago people were like cold exposure breathing you know, it's a bit fluffy and woolly I don't believe it but now everyone's like wow Wim Hof he is proven now I'm doing something, I don't know if you saw on socials, Cambo with a K. You ever heard of Cambo? No, but I saw a, a, the, the tile of you doing something that looks pretty interesting. Yeah, it's been done by the natives of the Amazon for hundreds of years. Right. It's the Amazonian tree frog. Right. And I'll go to somewhere where they work with 11 tribes in the Amazon. So it's very authentic, very as they would do it over there. And um, they'll burn you. So about one recently you can probably see down there they'll burn your set number of times with a with a josh stick and then they'll apply cambo the wow. amazonian tree frog secretion into the burns it goes in through your lymphatic system you feel pretty strange for a bit and then i'll projectile vomit for about 20 minutes is um, that like an initiation type ceremony no it's something no? they do they call it the vaccine of the forest it's antifungal, antiviral, non-toxic. You could eat a whole frog and it wouldn't kill you. You'd have a fucking bad day. <laughs> it's not going to kill you. And um, it is legal. There's nothing illegal about it. It's non-psychoactive. I had that done. And I came back and saw Jamie, my partner. I said to her, if ever there's a cure for OCD, I think I fucking found it. That's the effect it had on me. I wasn't sedated. I wasn't high. I was just at peace with everything that had ever happened, the stress of the world. And I'm having it done once a month, every month. Now, that might not work for someone listening in. I'm not trying to promote or endorse anything. But I'm saying is there's some fucking pretty out there ways, things you can put in your toolkit. And I'm pretty sure, like Wim Hof, in 10 years' time, when me and you are talking again, because we're going to catch up regularly, me and you, <laughs> everyone will be going, fucking Cambo's brilliant, isn't it? So there's so many natural ways. They've been doing that for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. Well, it's an interesting um, perspective to look back to see what was going on hundreds of thousands of years ago or, or, or thousands of years before all of this modern living and, and such took place. Because I do believe a lot of answers there. Like the, like the um, psychoactive and the uh, uh, um, psilocybin, ayahuasca, like that's been around for fucking ever, man. It's like we're just reverting back to it. Have you experimented with any of of those procedures i have yeah, yeah psilocybin how, I how was, go with that yeah what's been your feedback you know what i've only recently explored that because uh, i wanted to get a lot of research in because there's lots of theories on cycling it you know two days on two days off and yeah. combining it with different things i didn't just want to chuck it in there i wanted to do it responsibly and um and research it and i did it in like a holistic space with someone else you know you're not supposed to do it out partying it's not a party thing. Oh, no, no, a, no, sure, yeah. Um, you know, music on, safe environment. Yeah. But I was kind of keeping a watch on them to make sure they were okay and they were safe because they were a little bit anxious about doing it. And I think that stopped me embracing it because I took more and more and nothing happened. I was like, when's this going to start? And they were having a fucking great time. <laughs> so I've explored with that. But what I like about Cambo is, you know, it's not psychoactive. Yeah. And they do three ceremonies all in one 
Hape, Cambo and Sananga eye drops all play a part in this kind of um, traditional, responsible um, setting and, and, and procedure, whatever you want to call it. So, so if I asked you the question, like, are you happy? Am I happy now? Are Am you, I? Are you, yeah, are you happy? I'd say yeah. What what qualifies happiness? Different for everyone. But I'm happy because I've got balance and I'm I'm in peace. It doesn't mean everything in my world's perfect, but I've got the resilience to deal with the shit. I've got the balance in my world and the awareness to know what I need to do and what I need to avoid. But that happiness can turn to unhappiness quite quickly. So if you were asking me this and I hadn't trained this week at all, I've been glued to a screen. I haven't been outdoors. I haven't spoke to anyone. Just with those few simple strategies, I can go from feeling peaceful, serene, balanced, to good with a mental illness or fucking shit with a mental illness. So today, I'm happy. How are you feeling? And you can't answer with okay, not bad or all right. Right now, I feel happy. Good. Or right now, I feel in flow. Like nothing's worrying me right now. I'm not in pain because I'm doing something I love. I think if you asked me if I was happy, hmm. Yeah, I don't know about that one. It's a hard question to answer. It's very hard. And I don't know whether I particularly want to chase that either. I would rather chase fulfillment and growth. Yeah. And you, you've quite rightly said then you've got the resilience to deal with shit now that you never used to have. Yeah. Now, training resilience is not always a happy thing to do. No. Training resilience means you have to put yourself in situations that demand you to become tougher. Yeah. So that's not a happy time, but it's a fucking rewarding one. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? growth at the end of it. Of course. The only thing that probably kill me is my comfort zone. Comfort zones kill people. You've got to push on a little bit in a right balanced way for you. And it can become uncomfortable, you know, growth and stuff. I mean, like even basic cold showers, cold exposure. I said, I'd never do that. I hate the cold. You get in a cold shower, it is uncomfortable. You know, it's not very nice at first. But then your capacity for stress increases and you start to go, this ain't too bad. I'm all right. I'm putting myself in it winningly. And then now I enjoy cold showers. Because you know there's reward on the other side, right? Absolutely. This is what I think most people get this the wrong way. So they go, right now, this is not uncomfortable. Therefore, I'm not going to do it. So they never taste that growth. They never taste that reward. Yeah. Whereas you're going, this sucks, but after I've done this, I'm going to feel fucking great. I'm going to be stronger. And we, I come a real stubborn loggerheads with, with my, my last guest, Becky, who I gave an example of this young lad who was coming down Snowden and, and um, I thought he'd reached the summit. He was with his mum. He was about maybe eight to ten years old. And I said, mate, well done. You did incredible to get to the top of Snowden. And, that. and his mum said, oh, we haven't got there. Like He's tired. I said, oh, okay. I said, you know, it's only 30 minutes though, right? Like, I said, you know, if you get back, you might regret like not getting to the top. And she said, well, what do you want to do, son? And he went, I want to go home. So she took him home. And my argument was that like, maybe dad or a more masculine presence would have said, come on, son. Like, I know, I know that you're tired, man, but we can get you to that top. Because the adult knows the importance of gritting your teeth and resilience. Yeah. Her argument, which was valid, but might... She said, look, Alex, not everyone values the same things that you do. Not everyone values finishing things. He might have valued a day out with mum and been in fresh air. Mm. But my deep kind of sense told me, yeah, that's all great. And he still could have got that. But something might happen in his life where he doesn't get a fucking choice. Yeah. He doesn't yeah. get a choice whether he gets to the top or not. And I think there's no better way than purposefully putting yourself in positions where you can train grit and resilience. Yeah, definitely. Because you can't stop every time you're tired, man. You I can't. think this is what's wrong with... You can't. And it's not the young lad's fault, and it's not the mum's fault, because she's doing what she thinks is best for her son, right? So it's yeah. not an attack. But as soon as I mention these stories, a lot of the people that have, you know, I have these conversations with get so on the back foot, like I'm attacking. It's not. I'm just saying, I know that when I was young, I would have loved to have been pushed. Yeah. 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 I completely agree with yeah. you. Having that that push, that drive, someone just giving you a bit of encouragement or whatever that looks like. Is the word, encouragement. Mate. Let me encourage you. Let me give you a little shove in that right direction and it's going to feel shit and uncomfortable and horrible. But then when you get through it, oh, wow, that sense of euphoria and achievement can be amazing. So everything about my head is saying, don't do it, avoid it, avoid it. But if you give me a bit of encouragement and a bit of a shove in that direction and I 
I'd do go for it. That was the right thing to do. I think we've ever done that and go, I wish I'd have done that. Yeah, I wish I never got to the top. Yeah, I wish I never got to the top. My legs are aching now. Like, you're going to go, wow, I fucking pushed through because I battled my mind. I went against it, did it regardless, and... And now I'm here. Even with that cambo, that feels uncomfortable. It's not pleasant. Like you have it, and you got to breathe deep, and you're not in any danger. But it feels uncomfortable. But afterwards, <laughs> you just think, "Yes, I've done it." I had, I had what's called a warrior stripe the time before last, and that's one of the most intense. It's five down the middle, down your heart center, and one on your wrist. It goes in through the lymphatic system quicker, apparently. Felt fucking weird, Alex. I felt horrible. I said to him, "How long have I done?" It's got to be on for twenty minutes. Okay. He said halfway. I said, "Take it off. Take it off. Get it off." He went, "No, fuck no. This is how they do it in the Amazon. You breathe. You'll get through it. You're not going to die because yeah. you're not. It's totally, totally safe." And he was right. I wanted everything about me that in that moment was screaming, "Get this medicine off me!" But he sat there and said, "You'll be okay. You're going to sit through it." Yeah. And it was the right thing to do. Well, that's the, exactly the same story, then, right? Like you were uncomfortable at the time, but isn't that why we look to our elders and our our wiser people? Yeah. Because hopefully, we entrust them to know what's best for us. Especially if you're eight. I mean, who, what fucking eight year old knows what's best for them? I didn't. Of course you don't. No. Nah. We, we still struggle as adults now. But like mm. if you're eight, what's best for you is playing the computer, eating crisps, because that's what you want to do. That's what makes you feel happy yeah. in that specific moment. But we know that that's not going to make you lead a happy life. I think we forget that love comes in all forms and tough love is one of the... Like, it's brave for me to go, um, Ryan, I really care about you, man. So the fact that you're drinking all the time, uh, I don't think it's the right thing to do. Oh, that's brave. Yeah. Just like it is to look someone in the eyes, like you said, and say, do you feel suicidal? Yeah. I mean, what an amazing question to ask. What mm. a caring question to ask. Take some fucking bottle, that does. Yeah. Doesn't it? Yeah, but you're asking from a place of love and kindness, of right? Of course. It's bravery. Yeah. Like, it'd be much easier just to go, how you doing, man? You're right. Yeah, yeah I'm sound. Yeah, yeah, cool. Or dodge it and think, hey, it's themselves, but I don't want to ask. It'd be uncomfortable. Mm. And oh, what if they say yes, shit, dodge, but... It is. It takes some drive, determination, encouragement, bravery, whatever you see it as. But you've got to push past and through these comfort zones. Because on the other side of that is a fucking good space. It really, really is. And, you know, we think that in the world of mental health, it's got to be all compassion and kindness and stuff. There's a time in my life when I needed that, that understanding, that kindness. But there's also a space for what I have had a lot of, which is... Come on, a kick up the arse. Mm. Come on, Ryan. One of my mates who knew me. Look, I know you're feeling shit, but you've got to do something about this now. Let's get your fucking gym kit on. Let's go and do legs. You're coming. I needed that and that. I needed both. If I just had one or the other, it's not a great balance. Mate, I wish I'd have had someone. When I had that breakdown at 28, if you'd have said that to me, I reckon you'd have pulled me out of that fucking depression so fast. Mm. So fast. Instead, I got cuddled for a bit. Which again... Not saying it's wrong, but it didn't it didn't actually help me, you know. Mm. I'm sorry to where you went through that. I've never heard about your uh, mental health, you know, crisis or yeah. what you went through. So yeah. I'm sorry you. Yeah, when I when anything terrible happens, and I'm sure you've reflected upon this, like I have a look at what I lost from it. So I, you know, I lost quite a lot. I lost all my money. I lost my girlfriend. I lost my marble. I lost a lot of shit, but I gained a lot as well. Mm. I wouldn't be sat, sat here with you doing this podcast, you know. It's like yeah. it's brought a lot of good things. But I still wish somebody had come like that and said, actually, Alex, it's not all right for you to be sleeping in your dressing gown all day. Like, come on, man. Let's go for a walk. I wouldn't have to be a fucking killer gym session. Just a walk. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But you get the point. Yeah, it's like, it. that would have been good. Somebody who, who had some tough love for me. Yeah. Because it's still love. It's still That's a great it. form. It's it not, is. It's, it's, not, it's not macho. It's not bully. It's not nothing. It's love from a place of kindness and I totally get that some people can't do that but it's that balance that's different for everyone but balance the key words you know there's the kindness compassion the it's okay let's you know do nothing and the tough love there's got to be that huge spectrum of stuff that we can apply to people we know I mean I remember one of my friends you know the, the days and the weeks where I couldn't leave the house and they come around and say right we're going for a run today I know what you're going to say you're not, not going to want to get your trainers on and we're going Everything about my head in that moment was like, I can't, I can't do it. I'm not doing it. I went for a run around Canuck, it was Canuck Chase. I cried the whole way around. But you know what? When I got back, I thanked them for it mm. and I felt 1% fucking better. And that stayed with me. I was like, so I can do some of this. I can. It feels horrible and hard and difficult, but I 
can push through because I've just proved it. And that kind of gave me that little bit of hope, that 1% hope to build back up on. But if I hadn't had that person telling me, you're doing this, you're doing this today, we're doing it. I've seen you crying, upset, you can't even, we're, today we're, we're doing it, we're going for a run. And I'm so grateful for that. Imagine if all men were like that, right? In terms of supporting each other. When's not the right time to do that? You gotta ask that person. You know, we're not there to die. But you would have assess. gone you would have gone, Oh no, I don't want to run. Yeah. They knew me well enough. Do you think that's what it is? Do you think it's trusting the person who's demanding of you? Yeah. And they tried loads of other things before. You know, you didn't just rock on up on, on day one of a crisis and go, Let's go for a run. They tried all this other stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. Sat yeah. with me in the darkness, got me to share my head. Um, and knowing what they knew about me, they just got that sixth sense. I mean, someone you know, you kind of think, I think I know what's going to work for you. I know how to help you. You're my friend. I know you well enough. And they just knew that. And they knew I was going to say no. They knew I was going to say, no, I can't. I can't. There's your kit. Get it on. We're getting the fuck outside of this dark room. We're getting some daylight and we're going for a run. And we walked a bit. We ran a bit. We walked a bit. You know, it was like that, that kind of approach to it. But if they hadn't given me that, that shove and that drive in that moment. But that's got to be applied by people who love us, care about us and know us. What an incredible story that is. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. I mean, there's so many lessons in that. My brain's fucking shooting off in all sorts of directions after that. Honestly, that's what strong mentors and role models do. That's why we need strong men. Yeah. So, uh, fuck all this like softy, soft route. And again, it's non-softy route because it's out of love. So we do need strong guys to bring up young boys we need it to teach yeah. them that lesson yeah so when you come on son i know you're tired but we're getting to the top of the mountain because it's good for you yeah because it's fucking good for you yeah and we know it's good for you and therefore yeah bite down on the gum shield for the next half an hour exactly. we're going and even if they hadn't made it to the top but they've got 15 minutes in yeah and you could tell them they tried they give it their all that's fucking good enough that's mm. that's great because they've tried they've pushed on they've pushed through a little bit but yeah bite down on the gum shield Let's, let's go. Let's just not think. Let's act. Let's not think about it. Mm. Let's just do it. And it's, it's that podcast is that podcast was on Tuesday. Today's Friday. It's been sat on my head for three days because I'm like, am I just viewing this in my stubborn terms of like, no, he should have gone to the top, or is there compassion and love in the fact that actually you've turned up today, we've been outside, let's go back. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm trying. I'm trying to be more open-minded so that my way isn't the right way. Yeah. But you know, when something inside you feel like you know, when you look around, and you see all, what guys are struggling with in modern day life, which yeah. a lot of it is the, the ability to to stick at things, resilience, grit, yeah. comfort zones. I'm like, that was your chance to yeah. show that you can do more than what you think you're fucking capable of. Definitely. It's education missed. It's like going to school but leaving an hour before the end and missing the best lesson. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I had a real kind of moment of this recently and I, I thought you like you, I thought, God, am I being a bit old fashioned in my views? Am I setting my ways? Is this right? Is it not? So I am, um, I went to watch a sports day. So I'm like step parent now for a five year old and a 10 year old. You know, I, no one prepares me for that because I've gone my whole life without kids in my world. Age of 41 and I'm couldn't, I'm trying to, you got the, the manual for how to operate these little humans. I'm winging it daily, yeah. but they're great. It's blessed. Went to watch the sports day, rocked to put sports day, right? And I was waiting for it to start, you know, the race, like go and the race or whatever. There's none of that. None of that anyway of what I saw. It was like watching a PE lesson. There were no winners. There were no losers. There was no start. There's no first, second, third and last. It was just a, a day of activities. And I didn't know how I felt about it because when I think back to sports day, when I lost the race or didn't come first or fell over, it felt shit, but I learned from it. You know, I had to feel winning and I had to feel losing and everything in between. Whereas this was almost presented in a way that we're not going to have winners and losers and first or last because you don't want to make anyone feel bad. And I'm like, but there's, there's lessons in that uncomfortable growth period, you know, of being last fuck I'm last I'm going to do better next time or just processing that emotion and like I say it was presented in a way that we're not going to have a first and last to protect so people don't get upset I'm like oh, I don't know how I feel about that the nice part of me kind of agrees like you know when you go to a race and you see like the little fat kid at the back who's like so far behind the crew like my heart just fucking pines for him yeah same and I'm like that's so sad 
But then there's another part of me that goes, I'd love to spend six months with this kid and help him get better. Yeah. When you when you lost those races, right, or when you come last, who was there for you to pick you up and go, do you know what, son? Like, you came last today, but what we're going to do is we're going to make sure when it happens next year, like, you do a little bit better than what you did today. Was there anyone there for you for that? Yeah, my old man, he, yeah. he was brilliant. He was, he was great. So he, he would build me up and say, it's okay, let's talk about it, let's get through it. And, you know, this is what we'll do different next time. Perfect. Because that's the difference, right? Yeah. Between you think, feeling like a piece of shit. Yeah. And you've, yeah, it hurts. But there's someone there saying, you can get better at this. Because mm. if you don't have that person, dad's not around or yeah. you don't have that shot like you can see how kids fall into that definitely place right of like yeah. i'm worthless yeah 100 percent. so yeah it's a good it's a good subject of 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 conversation that one about sports day yeah like i say it raised on my uh, mixed views and feelings sure. i was like god am i how do i feel about this and then I just reflect on those times when i've come home upset from something it didn't go right and the, the lesson and the learning in that uncomfortable space, I wouldn't change it now. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I think if it was me in charge of all that, I would have winners and losers. Yeah. And it's okay to come last. You have that kind message. Really. Of course. It is all right that you come last. And if anyone was bullying that kid for coming last, that ain't fucking happening neither. Yeah. But having a first, a second, a third, a fourth, having that competition, I think that's... That's healthy rather than protecting kids from that. It's exactly that. It's prepare or protect, right? Which one's healthier? Mm. Prepare, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, prepare for life. Like, life is, uh, unfortunately, it's not going to be fair. That's the problem. If we judge everything by what's fair at that age, you're in for a fucking shock when you become an adult because yeah. life ain't fucking fair. You ain't not. Gonna, you're not always going to get what you deserve. It's not always going to be, you know, uh, as things should. But, th but what interests me here, mate, is like, I feel like we're getting what we're asking for. So people are asking for these things you know um quality of outcome i think we're getting closer but as we're getting closer we're getting further away in terms of mental mm -hmm. health meaning we're trying to make it so fair for everyone and protect everyone's feeling so much that when people do get triggered they've got no idea how to handle anything any yeah. form of setback any thought of any form of someone challenging their concepts people get offended now you know if you don't agree with me i could take offense now and tell you that you're a piece of shit and it's not right Oh, when the fuck did that happen? Where does this come from? Because there's a skill in me listening to you and me not agreeing with anything you're saying. That's a skill. Yeah. You know, a real admirable one. If I can sit here and be quiet and let you express yourself yeah. and I don't agree with any of it, that's a skill. Mm. How many people have that skill now? Not many. We react. Don't many people will it's react. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, again, you, you learn that skill, right? Like the, this this day, this point I'm at in my life, you could tell me five plus five is 12. And I'm just, yeah. I'll just agree with you. If that's what you think, that's cool. I'm not going to argue with you or get into the battle of what I've in my 20s. What do you mean it's 12? It's not. It's this. Cool. That's what you think and believe. I respect your frame of reference and window on the world. It doesn't have to affect me. And that's because of the certainty what you've got in yourself? Um, and also the awareness that mm. it, it really it's none of my business. If you think 5 plus 5 is 12, it's none of my business. How tiring is it to try and correct everyone? Oh, uh, like so how tiring every day. is it? Yeah, to argue. I don't know how these people get on social media and argue all day. Oh, I don't. I've never done it. I, I just couldn't. I haven't got the energy. No, I haven't got the time, the energy, and I won't won't want to be involved with my phone that yeah. much. To it's fucking crazy, right? Yeah, yeah. I can I can see. It's hard to articulate why things are in such a mess. I can see it. I can see it, and I don't think we're making it any better by going down this whole. Yeah, putting fear into people about actually saying what they think i mm. think we think we're encouraging people to be authentic but we're not yeah we're not yeah. It, it's not heading that at least i don't think so no anymore. i don't think so yeah so how long have you been sober now um well i have the occasional drink now. okay so when we say sober yeah. in like aa or ca it means absolutely nothing ever under any circumstances so for example i couldn't consider myself to be sober in aa and do cambo because that's a mind altering Got substance you. not prescribed by a clinician or doctor but the principles of aa it was written in 1935 or 39 mental health didn't exist then so it doesn't consider the mental health aspect so it's a little bit old-fashioned um there's also rumors i think it's bill wilson that started it went through um lsd trial and after that lsd trial he became sober, so had a spiritual experience via a substance, and then 
So I'll have the occasional drink, but what I've got now is the awareness not to let it rule my life. And also I am managing my mental health, my obsessive compulsive disorder in the right way, which I never was. So when I say sober, I've not got a problem with alcohol or anything. Go on holiday, have a couple of drinks, step back from it. It's not something I'm doing habitually, you know, time and time again. And how important is the role that your your girlfriend's playing? Does she help you out a lot? Yeah, we balance each other out. We're we're opposites very much. She's a Gemini and I'm a Capricorn. I've never read too much into star signs, but no, trust me, me, she is a Gemini through and through. <laughs> and I'm a Capricorn when you when you look at it on paper. Um and when the balance is off, Alex, it's it's fucking it's off. But when right. it's on, it's proper on. So yeah, we support each other. It just works, it just is. You know, all the best relationships I've had have been like that, mate. When they're up, they're up. When they're down, they're f- yeah. Yeah. Can't say it's healthy for me, personally, because yeah, they're so fucking roller coaster. Um, but they taste so good at the top, man. Mm. They, you know what I mean? You know when you've got things right with a woman, yeah. you love. But then when it's wrong, fucking yeah, you yeah. can't get your head. You can't keep your head together. No. It's yeah, it's painful, man. Communication's everything, isn't it? You know, like it is. rather than me reacting and responding to what I think you're going through or doing or whatever. Now we can communicate and say, look, that what you said or what you did, it's made me feel this way and she'll communicate back and I think that comes with experiences. But yeah, like the highs are high, the lows are low, but I've felt that space in the middle of, of numbness mm. and I, I don't like that space, to be honest. I can deal with the highs and the lows, but being numb and like meh, not bothered, well, that's that's no good for me either. We're always going to be out there trying to chase the excitement, I think, to a degree. And um, with that comes problems. Well, that's life, isn't it? Like even even accepting that, mate, is quite liberating. Like it's supposed to be like that. Yeah. It's not supposed to be any other way. No. It's supposed to be up and down. That's life. And I think even me just accepting that going, yeah, this is pretty shit. It's fucking life. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Trying to fight that though, like feeling like you should feel good all the time. It's what often can make you feel like shit. So, mate, fi- like final better man question now, which is a traditional one, this one. Like, okay. What are you working on now in order to become a better man? I am working on Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Oh, hey, you just entered yeah. the game or you've been doing it for a while? Been doing it for a while as part of MMA in the yeah. cage fighting, and but I've never really embraced it because it's like a game of chess. It's a thinking man's yep. martial art, if you like. And I was like, oh, no, I just want the basics, like the rear naked choke and the arm bar for, for cage fighting. I want to punch someone in the face, really. But now I'm a bit older, a bit wiser, a bit more mature, um, getting little injuries from doing the, the high contact stuff. So I've proper entered into the world of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And um, it's been described as murder yoga. It's like yoga don't really work for me. You know, it's proven. It's great for mental health, but yoga, I don't know. I just don't, don't connect with it. But Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is kind of elements of yoga, but with that, that aggression, that competitiveness. Mm. No one's there to get hurt or get injured, but it is physically demanding. And it takes years of commitment to get any good at it, you know, three, four times a week. So that is what I'm working on at the minute. I've gone back to just doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, a martial art um, to become a better man. And that's better physically and mentally. It offers both equally for me. Yeah, and you mentioned the word commitment in there, right? Yeah. So I've started BJJ, yeah, it takes a lot of commitment, a lot of practice. Yeah. And you, you spoke earlier about stripping away ego. Yeah, when you're getting strangled like four or five times in five minutes, or armbarred, or yeah, it, it reminds you of who you are. Yeah, you know it I mean? does. And that there's always someone that can kick your ass. That's what I like about it. That's yeah. it. I train with a guy. Um, Where do you train, by the way? I train at Blood, Sweat and Tears oh, in what a great name. Nuneaton. Yeah. What a great name. And what works for me is it's early mornings at 6 a.m. You know, I've got a couple of kids in my world now, a couple mm. of dogs, so I've got work continuous. So I love that because I can influence going to bed at nine, get a good night's sleep, so I can get up at five and drive over to training for six. I'll train and get back the house is still asleep. I'm not missing out on family life. It's not impacting anyone but me. So all I've got to do is go to bed, get up and go. And um, it's a great gym. The guy I train with, he is, I mean, I don't want to make any assumption on his weight. He's a lot smaller than me. Purple belt. 
if he wants to pin me to the ground, mate, he's doing it. He's fucking doing it, and I can't move it. It's such a humbling experience, and it's really about your skill and technique, not your physical prowess. And I, and yeah. I love that about it. So yeah. I'm kind of addicted to BJJ for physical and mental health, both totally equal. Yeah, there's a black belt, Kevin Webb, that I was rolling with. He's a great guy and he makes me laugh because I always wind him up and say, look, I'll take it easy on you. you know? <laughs> and he, he says, right, I'm going to tap you out in 10 seconds. I was like, And he does the countdown when I'm rolling with him. Right. And I'm like, no, and yeah, he can tap me out whenever he wants. Yeah. Like that, it's brilliant. To be on the end of that is amazing. Can you, can you see how, what good actually looks like? Yeah. What years of practice looks like? That's what, again, it's another example, isn't it? Of rather than just saying, oh, this guy's great, I'm shit. It's like, what did that guy do to get that good? Yeah. Trained every fucking day for three hours. Did this, did that. And it's 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 a map. It's a blueprint towards becoming better. Definitely. That's what I love about BJJ. It's, yeah. 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 And there's times when I wake up and I'm tired and my course, head don't want to do it. Of and course. They're the best know, sessions though, right? Yeah. And I want the excuse, oh, Ryan, you've been working a lot. You know, have a, have a morning off. And my coach, he'll, he'll check in and WhatsApp me. I'll say, you come into training. I'm a bit tired. Get get the fuck to training Ryan yeah. so then when I achieve when because it's going to happen at some point a blue belt and two thirds of people drop out and don't get the blue belt that sense of achievement I've pushed through I've had someone I aspire to be like who you know inspires me and motivates me tell me get your kit on get your gear mm. and get to the gym yeah. let's do it mate I've loved talking to you today yeah you too man it's always love catching up with it's, you it's, it's been good and I think one of the reasons why you're so good for guys who are perhaps struggling with their mental health is because I think you seem to have a great balance between you've still got that warrior about you. Mm. You've still got that, like the guy who wants to take part in combat and be strong and be courageous, but you've got a very um, sympathetic and empathetic way of listening as well. Thank you. And it's such a great balance. I think it's a great seeing a guy especially one, like I say, you look tough, man. Thanks, brother. I know Appreciate you, but that. I know, but you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. So it's all the more appreciated when you can sit there and listen and have conversation and be empathetic. Yeah. But at the same time, you can say, come on, it's time to go, man. I yeah. think people will listen to you and I certainly respect you for, for what you've done, Thank for what you, you continue brother. to do. And uh, yeah, mate, I'm glad we, I like to say this is the first time we've actually met. So oh no, how no. bizarre is that? Crazy, mate. Bizarre. Okay. No, thank you for your kindness. Thank you for having me on. Uh, massive respect to what you do. Love cool. the podcast. Keep doing you, man, because it's, um, Cheers, it's certainly man. had a positive effect on me. So Thank you, mate. I mean, that was easy today. That's just me and you catching up. And we yeah. just happened to record it and fucking put it out. <laughs> Brilliant, mate. I love awesome. It. Love it. Cool. Hey, that was great, man.